You are watching WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. This is the 10 p.m. Report. Good evening, everyone. AIDS in Minnesota schools. Even before the disease is detected, Minnesota health officials have stepped in to deal with the illness and the fear. Today, the health department announced guidelines for school districts to follow. That comes just three days after it was revealed that some Minnesota school children carry the AIDS virus. Under today's guidelines, no children with the virus will be asked to leave school. It will be up to school districts to decide when children with the virus present a health threat or should be removed. And students should not have to undergo blood tests for the disease. Today, health officials said the parents should be concerned about AIDS but not overreact to it. Our health and science reporter, Tony Vigneri, has more on the parents' reaction. Health experts say it's only a matter of time before AIDS develops in school-age children. News that up to 50 children in Minnesota are carrying the AIDS virus is reason for concern, the experts say, not for panic. That's because the research shows children can't pick it up through casual contact in the classroom. Where the biggest danger lies for school person to school person transmission is in the teenagers where sexual activity has begun and where the potential for needle sharing uh, exists. In New York, parents protested and took their children out of school when students came down with AIDS. Officials here are hoping parents won't react like that. Stella Townsend says she wouldn't. She has two children in well, school. I don't know. I'm hoping that, that people take the information that they have available to them and base their judgments on some kind of rational basis and not some frantic emotional overreaction. Her 11-year-old son, Wayne, says in school they are not getting any information about AIDS. And if a classmate came down with it, he'd be concerned. Would you be scared? Well, it depends. If he was in my class, yeah, but if he was, if he was somewhere else in the school, I really wouldn't mind. It's obvious that more information about AIDS must be dispersed to the public, and there must be more education. The state health department guidelines announced today may be the first big step in that direction, since it is focusing on a situation before it becomes a major problem. While these guidelines are for school-age children, preschool children are at risk too. State health officials say they are in the process now of developing guidelines for daycare centers. Tony Vignari, WCCO Television News, Minneapolis. Those Minnesota state health officials also said today that the AIDS disease, as opposed to the virus, has not yet been detected in any school-aged children in Minnesota. A review of allegations of brutality by Minneapolis police was completed tonight by the City Civil Rights Commission. A special task force has spent the past several weeks taking testimony on allegations that police officers sometimes abuse minority suspects. Tonight, the commission said its findings show that many minorities have little confidence in the Internal Affairs Unit, that incidents involving use of deadly force were sometimes questionable decisions, and that a disproportionate number of alleged abuses involve minorities. However, the commission also praised Police Chief Tony Boza for his efforts to recruit minorities. The commission recommended better screening for possibly abusive police officer and also a review of the use of deadly force. Tonight, St. Paul attorney John Flanagan is back in Minnesota facing charges that he built clients out of nearly $1 million. Flanagan was returned to the Twin Cities one week after his arrest in Utah. And as Mike Walsh reports, state and federal authorities may announce tomorrow some more charges against John Flanagan. Flanagan waived extradition in a Utah court, giving up his right to challenge his arrest by police and customs agents last week in Orem. That's where he lived this summer with a former law clerk. He arrived at Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport shortly before 6, still handcuffed and, unlike last week, making no attempt to hide his face or his red-colored hair and whitish beard. Minutes later, Flanagan was transferred to the custody of Ramsey Sheriff's deputies. He said nothing in response to shouted questions, and he showed no emotion as he boarded a police van for the trip to jail. And while Flanagan was being brought back to Minnesota, a federal grand jury was meeting in Minneapolis. Prosecutors can't say exactly what that jury is considering, but they do say they hope to announce some developments in the Flanagan investigation probably tomorrow. Federal prosecutors say they're investigating Flanagan for possible violations of tax laws, false identification on a passport and social security cards, fraudulent currency transactions, and possible interstate transportation of stolen goods. Tonight, John Flanagan is back in his hometown of St. Paul for the first time since he disappeared in early July. He's being held in the Ramsey County Jail under a half million dollars bail. 
I'm Mike Walsher, WCCO Television News. During his absence, Flanagan was suspended from practicing law by the Minnesota Supreme Court. Amid the search for the dead and the missing in Mexico City tonight, there was a show of support and promise of help by the First Lady, Nancy Reagan. Mrs. Reagan brought a letter from her husband expressing sympathy and a promise of aid from the U.S. During her three-hour visit, Mrs. Reagan met with survivors of those twin quakes. It was quite an experience to see the devastation. Um, but it was wonderful to see the, the, uh, the courage of the, of the Mexican people. Today, there were some miraculous stories of survival emerging from the rubble. At one down building, a special TV cable was inserted through the debris, and it showed the face of a man trapped but alive. Crews continued to dig until they were able to free the man and his wife. Both were taken alive to a nearby hospital, but for at least 3,400 others, the story was far different. Authorities estimate the death toll may reach as high as 10,000. In the United States, donations continue to pour in to help the victims of the Me Mexican earthquakes. In Los Angeles, tons of clothing, blankets, and food piling up in warehouses. Red Cross officials are waiting for word from Mexico on whether the supplies are needed now. The Salvation Army says it has already collected more than five tons of various supplies. And in Dallas today, a 707 transport plane was loaded with supplies bound for Mexico. Church groups and Spanish-language radio and television stations had launched the relief drive. And in Texas as well, relief supplies remain in warehouses until they can be used in Mexico. Today in Mexico City, a plane arrived from Houston with medical supplies aboard. It was filled with ox oxygen equipment for city hospitals. Similar aid and expertise, including specially trained dogs, has arrived, and other countries around the world are contributing as well. Back. An investigation into why an earth shelter collapsed in St. Paul yesterday is underway tonight. A 49-year-old woman died in that accident. Investigators say they are not sure why it happened. The building, owned by Control Data, has been routinely inspected since 1979. Some experts believe the heavy rains may have been responsible for the collapse, but others say it has to do with the sheet metal used in construction. There are more than 50 earth shelters in the Twin Cities, and only the one now in ruins was made of metal. Tonight, rescuers have found the records of a small commuter plane that crashed in Shenandoah Nation National Park this morning. The Henson Airlines flight had 14 people aboard, and all are believed to be dead. Searchers lowered to the crash site by helicopter continue to look for survivors, but a doctor on the scene says there do not appear to be any. In France tonight, political leaders are demanding to know who ordered the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior. That is the flagship of the Greenpeace organization. Last night, French officials admitted that Navy intelligence officers had bombed the ship, but did not say who had ordered the bombing. The French parliament is considering beginning its own investigation. An aide close to President Francois Mitterrand reportedly released the money for that attack. Coming up in just a moment, President Reagan unveils his plan to balance the trade imbalance. And the nation's top teacher says it's time to get back to the basics as he goes back to the classroom in the Twin Cities. are out tonight and both of them good, give good grades to the class of 85. First of all, the SAT and the ACT scores were released today and according to their statistics, the SAT scores posted their biggest gain since 1983 or 1963. The combined math and verbal scores rose nine points to a total of 906. On the ACT system, Minnesota students scored a point and a half higher than the national average. Both tests are used by colleges in determining which students are accepted into their schools. Today's scores were hailed as evidence of progress in efforts to improve the nation's schools by the country's top educator. Education Secretary William J. Bennett was in the Twin Cities today, and our education reporter Debbie Ely has more on his visit and his reaction. William Bennett has been a crusader of the no-nonsense, back-to-the-basic style education. At times, he has even rolled up his sleeves and taught a history class to show how it should be done. Today, he wasn't teaching any classes, but he was preaching the message of basic education and said that improved SAT scores are due to that philosophy. This uh, general environment we've seen in the last few years of uh, uh, increased uh, evaluation and assessment, um, uh, looking at the curriculum to, to be sure that what's in there is uh, worth it and not just uh, having courses that waste people's time. And um, uh, I think it shows uh, the attention and work of a lot of people. That conservative philosophy also carried over in his attitude about AIDS in school. Bennett said the ultimate decision about whether students with AIDS should remain in school is a local decision, not a federal one, and needs to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Bennett also praised Minnesota's post-secondary program, which allows high school students to take college courses at taxpayer expense. And he also revealed a voucher system of his own for private school students who rely on public school teachers for remedial education. Earlier this year, the U.S. Supreme Court said public school teachers cannot teach those courses in parochial schools. Later in the day, Bennett visited Groves Learning Center, a private nonprofit school which teaches students with learning disabilities. Groves got a national award of excellence last year. While there, he watched a behavioral committee trying to resolve a schoolyard dispute between two students. Bennett smiled and remarked, maybe he could get some tips for dealing with Congress. Debbie Ely, WCCO Television News. Striking Hormel workers were ordered by a federal district court judge today to be, be, stop picketing rather First Bank branches. The Meatpackers Union has been on strike against Hormel since last month and says the bank influences Hormel's financial decisions. They took to the streets to demonstrate their point, but NLRB and Hormel lawyers argued this action is an illegal boycott. Today, a federal district judge issued a temporary restraining order and said the NLRB must decide if the meatpackers are picketing illegally. That decision should take between three months and three years. Union leaders called the court order a farce and say they do not rule out the possibility of defying it. In a speech at the White House today, President Reagan unveiled a plan to curb skyrocketing U.S. trade deficits expected to reach nearly $150 billion this year. Skip Locher of our Washington newsroom has those details. We don't want a trade war, the president tells a group of industry leaders, but he warns, I will not stand by and watch American businesses fail because of unfair trading practices abroad. I will not stand by and watch American workers lose their jobs because other nations do not play by the rules. So Mr. Reagan proposes a $300 million fund to provide subsidies to U.S. industries which are victims of unfair foreign trade practices. He'll also support tougher trade laws, but not the kind of import quotas and tariffs which he calls protectionist. I will strongly oppose and will veto measures that I believe will harm economic growth, cause loss of jobs, and diminish international trade. Minnesota Republican Bill Frenzel was at the White House for the Reagan speech. Now what we're talking about here is uh, band-aids and uh, perceptions. Frenzel believes the perception of a tougher trade policy will help Congress pass constructive, not protectionist, trade bills. But Democrat Jerry Sikorsky says perception is not enough. Now he's talking big but carrying a wet noodle in, in, a, in his attempt to address the problem. Sikorsky believes some import quotas and tariffs are necessary, and so does a spokesman for the Minnesota Farmers Union. Minnesota Farmers Union policy states that no products should be allowed to be sold, no agricultural products should be allowed to be sold in the United States that do not have a duty put on them to bring them up to 100% of fair market value in the United States or just our cost of production. And we don't think this is too much to ask, especially in these times. The president hopes his new trade policy will head off a showdown with Congress, which is under increasing pressure to cut the record trade deficit and restore American jobs. But it will be some time before he and we know if it will. Skip Losher, CCO News, Washington. Well, the value of the dollar did drop significantly today on European money markets, but the White House says don't despair. That is considered good news by the Reagan administration. In fact, Treasury Secretary James Baker was the first to talk about the devaluation of the dollar yesterday and said that's a better solution to the deficit than a trade war with friendly European nations. The stock market here seemed to agree, jumping 18 points in the first few minutes of trading this morning, but some economists say the move to push down the value of the dollar will backfire on the administration. Garment workers in North Carolina believe the president should forget about tinkering with the dollar and limit cheap imports from countries such as Japan. They have stitched together a giant pair of blue jeans, signed the pants, and to dramatize their wish that Mr. Reagan sign a bill to limit imports of cheap products. The blue jeans are 43 feet long, and since the White House won't take such big britches, the garment workers are now looking for another building in Washington that will hang the protest jeans in public. Now, around here, a lot of folks were wearing <laughs> raincoats over their blue jeans, their suits, their shirts today. But Mike Fairborn says he has a promise of better things to come. Well, if dryer's all you want, uh, okay, it will be better, but it's uh, still going to be cold, still going to be windy. The first day of fall is going to be a little bit warmer than the second day. We'll have all the details right after this. Autumn made its point today, kind of like a frigidaire, I guess. I had another word for it, but I'll... 
<laughs> oh, well, good, good, bad. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit uh, blustery, raw, uh, all those kind of words for today. And it looks like tomorrow's going to be just about not as wet, however. The rains are that's leaving, and that's good news anyway. Our uh, weather guide, we did reach uh, up into the 50s, would you believe? Well, that was the midnight temperature last night because the temperature throughout most of the day continued to fall and then just has kind of held steady at around 44 degrees for the last several hours. Almost an inch of rainfall fell at the airport from this uh, episode of rain that we had, and that's fairly significant for this time of year to get that much rainfall in a 24-hour period here toward the end of September. Well, our high temperatures today, uh, kind of a misnomer, I guess, because these are kind of chilly, too, for this time of year. Temperatures only in the 30s up in the southern prairies of Canada, pushing down into the North Dakota area, 40 degree temperatures out to the west of us and then of course the 50s that we had but really that wasn't the uh, the the real cold air because it's still further out to the west the jet stream is still pushing that air southward before it takes a turn up to the north and we're just right on the cutting edge of that cold air but by tomorrow night we're going to be just about under it and if there's any threat of frost for us it's going to be tomorrow night not tonight but tonight freeze frost warnings are out for both the north and south dakota area the entire state's it's going to be cold out there tonight our satellite picture shows the clouds that we've had over us producing the rains, lifting out to the northeast. Another little batch of clouds moving down through the Dakotas. Those are going to slide on to the south. And clearing taking place back up in there is going to allow that temperature to really drop off tonight. What rainfall we've had over us is now up around the Duluth area. A few little scattered showers still to the east of the Twin Cities and then a big band of showers extending to the east. Most of what you're seeing out in the Dakotas are little pockets of snow. That's been falling most of the day today, but we think the rain is over with for us now for a while. Our weather map for tomorrow is going to have a front well to the east of us. Maybe some flurry along the north uh, border of Minnesota and the southern areas of Canada. For us, it looks like we're just going to stay mostly cloudy, but we're not going to warm up very much. High temperatures are going to be in the 40s for highs. That's right, I said 40s for highs with the chance of s at least some scattered frost here in the southern part of the state early, not tomorrow morning, but the next morning. Our current conditions were cloudy with 45 degrees, humidity is 68%, west winds at 17, 29, 8, 4 with the rising barometer. Our forecast then for the remainder of the night, it'll be turning partly cloudy, so we begin to get some of those little breaks, a low of around 36 degrees, west-northwest winds at 10 to 20. Tomorrow it'll be mostly cloudy and cool with a high of only around 48 degrees, northwest winds at 10 to 20. Tomorrow night, partly to mostly cloudy, 37 for a low, and for Wednesday, partly to mostly cloudy and 49 degrees. The extended forecast does call for still continued cool temperatures on through the rest of the week, another chance of some precipitation on Saturday, another low down in the mid-30s. And we had had the possibility of some flurry activity here in the morning. We think that chance is so slight mm -hmm. that we didn't even mention it again tonight. You know, we need a bright, sunny day so that we can see those uh, fall leaves. We'll get it. Don't worry. It's going to be a little while before this system works its way out. Can you give out, us though. exact day and hour? Sunday. <laughs> this, <laughs> doesn't time? Mean, <laughs> this doesn't Check mean we me have one of those. <laughs> car plug-in alerts, does it? No, 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 no. Not you even might want to start minutes. checking the antifreeze, though. Oh, I don't like that <laughs> word. Not at all. Thanks, Mike. All right. Coming up in just a moment, a story about some forgotten allies. Dave Nimmer will tell us about a new program to help some of the soldiers who valiantly fought side-by-side -side with us in Vietnam. team, there is always a lot of pressure on Gopher hockey coaches to win, and like it or not, Doug, the Gophers will be favored to win the WCHA. You know, the last thing the Gopher football team needed this week was to lose one of their top players. Saturday night, wide receiver Melvin Anderson caught this 75-yard touchdown pass from Ricky Foggy in the Gophers' 62-17 route over Montana. Anderson is the Gophers' biggest deep threat, but later in the game on another pass route, Anderson pulled up lame with a hamstring injury, and they don't heal overnight. Anderson is not expected to face second-ranked Oklahoma on Saturday night at the Dome, so the other wide receivers are going to have to pick up the slack. Oklahoma is the early 15-point favorite, Don, but what the Gophers are going to have to concentrate on <laughs> is defense this week, somehow yes. trying to stop that Oklahoma running attack. Will Anderson be good for the rest of the season? Oh, Does I think so. Know? Maybe another couple of weeks. You know, those things are tough to come back from. I think Holtz wants to get him back for the Big Ten opener against Purdue. All right, and independent races, you're picking... St. Louis and Toronto in the World Series. We'll find out. That's what Dave told me. Anyway. <laughs> That's a good pitch. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Tomorrow, the uh, second day of autumn, will be cloudy with temperatures approaching something we might call even cold. That's all our news for this evening. We thank you for joining us. Good night to all of you, and if you'll forgive me, Don, good night, Dave Moore, wherever you are. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jimmy. Good night, everybody. Good night, Dave. The 10 p.m. report.
with Pat Miles and Don Shelby. Mike Fairborn's weather and Mark Rosen Sports has been a presentation of WCCO Television, serving the people of the Twin Cities for four decades. <laughs>